Welcome to a new episode of Vice Confidential. Today, we'll dig into one of the most infamous yet unsolved cold cases in American history, the Boardman murder of 1972, where an unknown murderer had strangled the life out of a 12-year-old boy, Bradley Bellino. Sexual assault, unnatural death, and missing children. These three things were common in the string of mysterious adolescent deaths that took place over a number of years in the small town of Boardman, Ohio. However, the strangest truth binding them all together is that the murderer was never found. Or was he? With a lack of proper evidence, the case went cold decades ago, until it was finally reopened in 2001 with the fresh possibility of hunting down the killer, thanks to new DNA identifying and matching technology. Join us as we explore the tragic story of Bradley Bellino, and how after 50 long years, the true identity of his bloodthirsty strangler may have finally been revealed. Let's begin. In 1972, Boardman, Ohio was a growing town that was still mostly rural. Halfway between Cleveland and Pittsburgh, it was the kind of place where children could run around without their parents watching them. Boardman was a safe, quiet suburb of Youngstown, which was still a busy steel city at the time. On March 12th, everything changed when 12-year-old Bradley Bellino left his best friend Donald Templeman's house to walk home and he never returned. Since there was no school on that day due to Easter break, Bradley had spent the afternoon with Donald. The boys were attending sixth grade at Boardman Center Middle School, where they had also played baseball together for the past three years. Bradley was the catcher, Donald was the pitcher, and Donald's dad was the coach. Bradley's parents were hardworking blue collar folks, with his mother Elisa being a buyer for Lane Bryant and his father working shifts at a steel company. While they were away at work, Bradley would often spend time with Donald and the Templemans at their house, where he would have dinner with them after being dropped off by the bus from school. On one fateful Friday afternoon, the boys had meandered the streets of Boardman before ultimately finding themselves at Donald's residence in Applewood Acres, an affluent community. Little did they know, this seemingly idyllic neighborhood would soon become the backdrop for an unspeakable crime. The sun began to set on the quiet suburban evening, and Bradley's dad called him home. Mrs. Templeman had been at the grocery store, so she couldn't drive him home as per their usual routine. On the same night, Mr. Templeman also found himself confined to his bed, battling a vicious bout of the flu. Bradley's mother was occupied with work, and his father was unable to pick him up, so he made the decision to embark on a three-mile journey back to his residence on McClurg Road. Here, the story gets murky as different sources provide conflicting accounts of what happened next. The only thing that's certain is Bradley was reported missing the following day at precisely 3.20 p.m. As the holiday weekend came to a close, police, family, and friends were still trying to find the lost boy. Bradley, a known wanderer, had vanished without a trace on Easter Sunday. His family knew in their gut that something wasn't right. On the morning of April 4th, at approximately 8 a.m., the lifeless body of Bradley was finally found. His remains were discovered in a dumpster, located behind Isali's Dairy Store in the Boardman Plaza, approximately two miles away from Donald's residence. The man who stumbled upon the terrifying sight was Paul Smith, a very sanitation company employee who was carrying out his regular job of collecting trash. The dumpster was only half full, and concealed beneath layers of cardboard boxes and Easley's refuse was the body of 12-year-old Bradley Bellino. He lay motionless on the ground, his sneakers jutting out at an unnatural angle. His striped trousers were undone and pulled down, while his head hung low, restrained by a tight belt wrapped around his neck. Tony Dapolito, a rookie Youngstown cop on the vice squad at the time, was Bradley's first cousin. Police in Boardman summoned him to the scene to identify the body. He assisted in the search for his close relative, leaving a family dinner on Easter Sunday to look out for him, and recalls that searchers had been in the area of Boardman Plaza and Isalis, but had not found him. It then became his responsibility to inform his Aunt Elisa and Uncle Joe that their son had been found. Before we delve into one of the most bizarre missing child cases of the 1970s and try to uncover the identity of one of America's most heinous killers, subscribe to Vice Confidential for more true crime stories that will make you think twice before walking home by yourself late at night. Now, let's continue with our investigation. 
Donald spent the weekend searching for his best friend before returning to school. To this day, he is still traumatized by what came after. On Tuesday, he heard his math teacher talking to a few members of the faculty. The Bellino boy has been found, she said upon returning to class. The students jumped and cheered before the teacher added in a brutal, cold tone, but he's dead. For the next hour, Donald has no recollection of anything. He's not sure if he passed out or simply blacked out, but the next thing he remembers is going to the office and asking to be excused, where Dr. David A. Belinke performed a post-mortem examination. According to the coroner's report, his time of death was 9 p.m. on Saturday, April 1st, over a day after his last confirmed sighting. Dr. Belinke determined that Bradley Bellino had been sexually assaulted immediately before he was strangled to death. Soon after, Donald claimed that the police took him to the station with his father. They showed him Bradley's clothes and asked him if these were the ones he was wearing when he left Donald's house. Donald confirmed that they were. Then officers showed him the belt that had been discovered around Bradley's neck and asked him if it belonged to the young boy. Donald confirmed that it did. Tony DePolito always thought he'd find the answer that would finally give justice to his young cousin, whom he had to identify about 50 years ago. He was a police officer and then a Mahoning County investigator. Quote, every step of the way, just nothing, he said. A dead end. There has got to be someone out there that knows. And I'm hoping he comes forward and drops a dime on the people that did this. It's been a long time. Maybe they're dead. But it doesn't matter. Someone knows. Unquote. As is often the case with long unsolved cases, there are some conflicting reports in the details. Case files are closed because the investigation is still ongoing, making it difficult to reconcile some of the facts. The questions that remain are who reported Brad missing, and why he decided to leave and walk home from the Templeman house. Local newspapers published that Bradley's mother, Elisa, had said he was missing when she returned home from work. According to official reports, Bradley was supposed to stay at Donald's until 9 p.m., so it's unclear why he left an hour and a half earlier. Other news reports have stated that his sister Debbie called the police that Saturday afternoon, but the coroner's report says it was his father, Joseph, who called the police first. The coroner's findings showed that Joseph Bellino last saw his son around 1 p.m. on Thursday, March 30th, when Bradley went to the mall. He asked for permission to spend the night at the Templeman's and was scheduled to return home by 4 p.m. Friday. Later, he called his father and got the okay to stay at the Templeman's until 9 p.m. Joseph went out for the night on Friday and went to bed around 2 a.m. Saturday, not realizing his son had not returned home. He then awoke around noon, and upon discovering that his son was not there, he contacted the Templemans. They informed him that Bradley had left the previous night and that they hadn't seen him since 7.30 p.m. Joseph then went out looking for his son before reporting Bradley missing to the Boardman police. Bradley called his brother on the Friday night before Easter and told him he'd be sleeping over at Donald's that night. Joseph called about 20 minutes later to tell him he needed to come home instead. He then left without a ride at 7.30 p.m., as instructed by his father. When Bradley left, Donald went to bed, and at around 10 p.m., Bradley's brother called and asked Mrs. Templeman if Bradley had left, because he never returned home. Bradley had left hours before, she told him. Donald's mother awoke him immediately, and they got in the car to drive the route Bradley would have walked. They couldn't find him anywhere. It's unclear what impact these discrepancies had at the time, but the uncertainty surrounding the answers may help explain why police were not called sooner. Bradley was the youngest of the Bellino family's four children, and the natural chaos of a household of six people, all on different schedules, likely contributed to the delay in reporting him missing. Another question with conflicting answers is when Bradley was last seen. Early newspaper reports say he was seen Saturday afternoon playing basketball on Matthews Road near Donald's house, at the Southern Park Mall, and at the Dairy Queen near North Lima. Later reports state that the sightings were unconfirmed and that witnesses may have seen Bradley at those locations on Friday. Because there was no school for the holiday, witnesses may have mistaken Saturday for Friday. Retired Boardman Police Chief Jack Nichols believes Brad was last seen Saturday because the meal in his stomach at the autopsy was chicken and pineapple, which he ate at the Templeman residence on Friday. Donald believes the reports that say Bradley was seen on Saturday are false. 
As the investigation deepened, it became increasingly probable that Donald was the last individual to lay eyes on Bradley before his untimely demise. The coroner's report tells a story, but it leaves a gaping hole. Where was he during those crucial hours from 7.30 p.m. on Friday until his tragic death at 9 p.m. on Saturday? His whereabouts remain a mystery. Was Bradley held captive in an unknown location, or was there another crime scene yet to be uncovered? The answers remain elusive, shrouded in darkness and mystery. In the years that followed, police would pursue numerous leads, carry out numerous investigations, and administer numerous polygraph tests, but none would yield conclusive evidence. Decades later, the investigation was finally resumed in 2001. DNA evidence was gathered after the boy's body was exhumed. Bellino's clothing from the time of the murder was also examined for DNA. And for the very first time, the police had a break in the case that had haunted them for over 30 painful years. The suspect's DNA was later submitted by police to the combined DNA index system, but no match was made. It wasn't until 2018 that they could get anywhere with the evidence. Once the police and Boardman started to work with Paraben Nano Labs, a company in Reston, Virginia that helps law enforcement agencies with DNA phenotyping. DNA is used in phenotyping to narrow down the list of suspects to a group of people with similar physical traits or a large family tree. Parabon told police and Boardman that they were probably looking for a man of European descent with fair or very fair skin, freckles, brown or hazel eyes, and black or brown hair. As the police started collecting DNA and sorting through possible suspects, they first looked at people who fit the profile and were in the family tree of the suspects. It turned out to be a quite difficult task, considering family trees don't always take into account births outside the marriage or adoptions, and not every suspect was willing to give DNA samples. Suddenly, a miracle struck when investigators looked into the most recent batch of the family tree provided by Parabon. After a relative of the family tree voluntarily agreed to give their DNA for testing, the program found a 98% match with the DNA found on 12-year-old Bradley's body. This led to the investigators narrowing their search down to one profile that matched the traits that previous officers working on the case had compiled. The prime suspect was unrelated to the family, lived briefly in the town, and did an everyman's job as a truck driver at a bottle company the perfect disguise for someone who can change his skin like a chameleon, never to be found. With this new DNA evidence in hand, the suspect was identified to be Joseph Norman Hill, who died in 2019 of natural causes. At the time of the murder, Hill lived on Shadyside Drive in Boardman. In 1978, he moved to Yucaipa, California, where he lived until his death. He was 32 at the time of the murder. During Hill's time in Boardman, Two other cold cases with missing teens happened. Thomas Baird, who was 15 at the time, was found on Lake Park Road in 1970 and died just a few days later. David Evans, who was 13 at the time, went missing in January 1975. Six days later, Evans' frozen body was found in the bushes of a parking lot. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Vice Confidential. As of now, the police are still trying to determine whether there is a connection between these horrific murders. While we may never know what prompted Hill to take an innocent child's life in the most brutal way imaginable, we want to know what you think in the comments down below. If you found this video informative and fascinating, be sure to hit the like button, share with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. We look forward to exploring more true crime cases with you in the future on Vice Confidential. Until then, we'll see you on the other side.